certificate of completion. Unfortunately, we're not an ASHA CEU provider, but you can at least get a certificate of attendance for your PDP points. Just send me an email um, and I'm happy to get one emailed out to you. All right, so with that, I am gonna turn it over to these ladies and let them tell a little bit about themselves and then get started on their presentation. All right, and are you all seeing my screen? There you are, that's it. You're seeing the presentation? Yes. Perfect. I can't see you all now though, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so anyways, um, my name is Sabina LeClaire, like um, Ms. Sussery said, and I want you to know that um, we are gonna be presenting the AT and AAC and the IEP, but this is gonna be kind of an interactive. We are gonna be asking for participation from the group. So be prepared to unmute mics, type in the chat, um, we're also going to be doing some polls. So if you go to the chat room, you'll see that I've posted. Um, I'm posting a link right there to the chat. And Saskia and I will take a moment about a third of the way through the presentation to make sure that everyone's been able to link into the poll. And I'll let Saskia introduce herself for a minute if she wants. Yeah, I'm Saskia Splain. I, as as uh, Ms. Ussery said, I am a speech language pathologist working in Anderson County. I am a CF. I'm a newbie, um, but I've been working with uh, folks with disabilities for quite a number of years um, in a different capacity um, before I decided to become an SLP. Um, so we really just wanted to dig into this and find out some time for that. <laughs> I ask folks to mute your mic until it's time to do the um, kind of interactive participation. We're just getting a little bit of uh, background noise. Thank you. Sorry, ladies. Okay, and if everyone's ready, we're going to get started. Um, first of all, in case you don't know much about Tennessee Talks, it is a grant funded project by the Tennessee Department of Education. And it was put together to provide assistance with AT and AAC for those students that have complex communication needs. And on the next slide, we're gonna show you the map of Tennessee so that you can see who to reach out to. So Saskia, if you'll, there you go. So you can find your county and then you can see which of the different agencies you would want to reach out to if you have questions about AAC or AT. Um, what we ask is that we can help you with implementing um, AAC. We can help you with evaluations, training. There's a lot of resources just on the Tennessee Talk site, so please go to that website if you have more questions. And this is our big disclaimer. <laughs> We are not lawyers, so if you have any legal questions, we ask you to contact your school attorney because we have just done a lot of research. It was something that Saskia and I both have, in our roles as SLPs in the school, have been concerned about. Are we documenting things correctly? And we found out a lot of information, and that's why we put this PowerPoint together. So. Here's one of our first questions for you. Feel free to write in the chat because we would like to address some of the questions that you have. What are some main issues you have when it comes to AC or AA or AT um, and the IEP? Like putting it in the IEP, where to document it, how to document it. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we're going to try and address as many of those as we can. So we're going to get going. And first off, um, the things that I want to kind of give you that background information. There's some legal mandates and precedents that you need to know about. And these are the three acts that we felt were most important. Um, there's Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. There's the ADA, American with Disabilities Act. And then we have IDEA, the Individuals with Disability Education Act. And these three acts, as you're going to see when we explain them a little bit further, all impact the IEP and you'll notice a lot of um, overlap between them, but then there are some differences. 
So when we're looking at Section 504 and how it relates to AT and AAC, the thing to know about it is a federal um, statute that pertains to discrimination and civil rights for students between the ages of three and 22 years of age that have a disability. And it states that no person may be denied benefits or excluded from participating in a program because of their disability. So as many school SLPs, you have heard about FAPE or F-A-P-E. Um, so this acronym comes into play in Section 504. It requires a school district to provide free, appropriate public education. So this is when we start thinking about each qualified person um, that we have to provide this free and public education, but we can't discriminate based on severity of their disability. And um, another thing to know is that the school with Section 504 does not have to honor an evaluation that the parents are requesting. But if, if you do not um, go ahead and proceed with that evaluation, then you do need to provide the parents with notice of their procedural rights and kind of be ready to discuss why you're not going to do that evaluation. Um, Section 504 gives us another portion of leeway here with the IEP and AAC evaluations because it does not require that we do formalized testing, but it does require that we have multiple sources of information that we need to look at. So for example, observations, data collection, medical history, we need to have multiple sources of information to put together to back up our decisions that are made. And then these decisions are to be made by a group of people who are knowledgeable about that student. So on the next slide, we're going to be looking at the American Disabilities Act. And this act pertains to individuals of all ages, but it states that a person with a disability cannot be excluded or discriminated against. It also states that the individual has the right to participate in all state and local government programs and services with equal access to public entities. So the big takeaway on this is that cost and alteration of services cannot be used as an excuse to deny someone's participation. Which is a little different than the IDEA. So in the IDEA, um, which we all know and love dearly, right? This is the one we talk about the most often. Um, AT is, first of all, something I did not that it's written, but I didn't actually understand exactly what it meant, and it's a whole other subject, is assistive tech must be considered as part of every single IEP process that we do. Um, that's that little checkbox and special considerations. Um, so that's a whole other presentation. Um, the next thing is with IDEA, AT systems must comply with local and state policies. And the Tennessee Department of Ed doesn't have a formal policy outside of the federal mandates, but some districts do. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, financial constraints or a modified program are not allowable reasons for denying a student the necessary AT. Um, and in order to ensure FAPE, AT devices and services must be accessible to the student, which is an additional um, mandate through IDEA. So definitions under IDEA. There are two really important things we need to think about. We need to think about devices, which is what most people think about when they think of AAC, right? The actual physical piece of equipment, um, you know, the iPad, the, you know, dedicated device. That is what we're talking about when we're talking device. It does not include um, anything that's surgically implanted. So the, our cochlear implant, uh, that is not considered an assistive tech device for the IDEA. And then we have assistive technology services. So this includes evals and purchasing and figuring out what's gonna work best for the kid and the training that goes along with it. Um, so, 
IDEA very specifically gives the mandate of we need to think about devices and services when we're thinking about AAC. And now we get to have some fun. So that was like the legal, the legal stuff. And now we get to have some fun. <laughs> and I posted um, this poll for you a couple of times, so please look it up because we would like your participation. And give us a thumbs up in the in the video or on the thing if you yeah. if you're on, just so we have a general idea. And Sabina, will you let me know when we're ready? Sure. I'm gonna wait for a few people to let us know they've been able to link up. And you guys can do a video thumbs up physically, or you can use the little um, emoji guy under the, um, I don't know, one of the icons at the top of your of your bar. Awesome. Great. All right. We have folks go. Good. OK, we feel so we want you to go in and answer this poll for us, please. It says, what is your level of comfort with considering AT and AAC for every student's IEP? So it looks like um, it's kind of split pretty evenly between comfortable and you know a little bit. All right. Yeah. It's a it's a great place to be. At least we don't have anyone that says they don't have a clue. <laughs> anyone have any comments about that? Anyone, you know, th this is an interactive thing, folks. I, this is our time to chat about our AAC and IEP difficulties. And, and we know just anecdotally, this is often a very confused area and often something that is flagged and monitoring in districts. So certainly ask questions um, to kind of get clarity and help with this area. And we'll have plenty of time throughout the um, presentation to ask questions too. If you want to just put them in the chat or you can um, ask them verbally if you want to unmute. But we can go on to the next one then, Saskia, if no one's asking any questions. All right. So here is our first scenario. So. A parent tells you in the IEP meeting that they are currently using an iPad with a communication app on it at home, but you have not currently been using any AAC with that student at the school. What should you do? And I can't see the chat, so Sabina. If nope, no one's me. chatting yet. No one's no, chatting, oh no. Hopefully they're, they're all nervous. <laughs> And this can't be a unique scenario. I'm sure you guys get this a lot. So what is the uh, you can try. obligation? You could try to use the app with the student in your therapy sessions and see what they do with it. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, that's a great idea. And we have a comment too in the chat room that says offer to consult with the AT department. And that's a great idea. I know there are some districts who are not lucky enough to have an AT department. So in those cases, um, you know, what would you do? You may be one of the sole SLPs and and ha not have the same resources that larger districts do, but that doesn't um, preclude you from having to address that issue. No. OK. So what's what we found um, was basically which comes first, home use, school use, which one comes first? And the answer is it doesn't really matter. Um, so basically, if a parent comes like that situation and says, hey, I've been using this device at home and it seems to be working, it triggers um, the needs the need for us to look closely at that, to try it out in the therapy room and see if that's something that is working and see what needs to happen. Um, and does it trigger an AT eval um, in order to see what the student needs in order to access their curriculum? Um, because if a parent is using it at home and it's working, it's probably gonna work in the school. Um, and so it triggers that way. 
Um, just like we want to make sure that we're, you know, trying to get some of that carryover at home too. Um, so yeah, that was a, one that I hadn't really thought of. I haven't, I'm new, so I hadn't had that circumstance happen yet, but I can see it happening, um, especially as we get a lot of parents who kind of take it into their own hands. Um, and I'm sure you all have had those people. Um, and so figuring out, you know, mom puts Proloquo on the, the home iPad and then we get the device at school and we're like, um, and so that was an interesting one. I will say that, oh, Christy also said, communicate with the parents to obtain info regarding use and effectiveness, try to incorporate into the school setting. Um, so yeah, that first line with communicate with the parents is huge. I mean, that in, a, in itself is a fantastic first step so that you yes. guys can open that line of communication. Definitely. So I I did want to say something. Am I am I unmuted? I can't tell. Yes. Yes. You this are. is Janice Reese. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is Janice um, from Tennessee Talks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we both logged into the same um same one. So uh, one of the things that I get asked sometimes on that same topic is, you know, if a parent has been to say an advocacy support program, the STEP program, or, you know, and there are Facebook support groups. There are a million resources, thankfully, out there for both um, staff and families. But sometimes they'll say, oh, my friend or my, you know, someone in my group has a child with similar situation and we tried their device and it works. So now I want that. You know, that again, like Saskia said, triggers your obligation to say, well, let us look and see if that is, in fact, what we want. You know, if that or they'll say, I tried this for a week and it worked really well, to which you would respond, well, now let us try it for a week and see how well it works, because you're able to collect data, 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 data on whether that is because they may have gotten a really great idea, but it might not be the right language system. It might be too complex. The grid might be too big or what have you. But I always say that number one thing is be receptive. Receptive to the parent's suggestion is number one because, you know, they're and then you also have to say, what are they saying in that they will often say, oh, my child says 500 things with this device. Well, I need to collect some data to confirm that it's not five things and you're kind of, you know, guessing that they understand more than they do. So then it brings it down to just an evaluation. Um, of whether that whether that device is right or not. So, but I, I have people say, well, I I had um you know I've had this situation recently, and I had two just last semester who said that. Well, do we have to um do we have to try the device because it's what the parent wants to try? That's that's a really great place to start. Even if it is not what you wanted, you show them in fact that maybe that is too too much over the child's head. But just by dismissing it, you're um. You can't, you can't, can't dismiss it. So that, that, that's so it for me. We have a really good question out here um, from April. Thank you. It says, should the parents be asked to send the device or is it the school's responsibility to provide something at school? So this is where you're going to need to get back with talking to the parent because if they're comfortable sending something in for you to trial and see what they're using, that's a great place to start. Um, the device then is it's something owned that, by the student. Sorry, sorry. I was I was gonna say, especially if it's something that they've customized for that student, then that would be even more important if it's not just the generic layout that's comes with the device. Sorry, Sabina. That's okay. <laughs> but I was gonna say about the same is just have them send it in if they will, and um, try to see what they've done and see if they want to send it in every day to use it that's a great place see if the data supports using that device and that program and if not it's at least a good trial for you to use to decide what um, aac or at product you would want to go with for that student and i would can i also add one thing to that sorry guys i don't need to mm -hmm. interrupt you no, um, the school is absolutely obligated, though, to provide something. So whether it be that device that the family is willing to send into school, and that needs to be an agreement between your leadership and the parents. Um, there's usually some kind of an agreement that's made if the um, device is damaged in some way. But 
even if they do, what happens if they forget to send that device one day to school and the school can't we, say, well, sorry. So the school always has to have something on hand as well. We actually uh, are going to talk about that later on. <laughs> that's right. I hope. Being that's okay. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> sorry. So we can go on. Um, all right, so scenario two, first grader moves into your school and is highly unintelligible. They have a speech only IEP with no AT or accommodations listed. What are your thoughts when you're planning that first IEP meeting to your school? Does anyone have a suggestion or a thought about it? Anyway. I'm probably the rarity. Um, I, this is Angela from Rutherford. Um, my team better at least have a low tech system in place and they better have already called me so that they can implement and write that into the IEP because we're we're having to work on a total communication approach at this point until we can get the child evaluated and determine what is the most appropriate future matched system for that child. Yes, love it. <laughs> and we also have a great comment. I'm going to read for Saskia to hear, um, but it's talking about we can discuss AT options and explain that research shows that advanced um, enhanced verbal communication with AT, AAC, that you're going to be showing that, you know, it might progress faster. And you can also let the team know a functional method of communication is our priority. So that was a great comment. Oh, man, you, you both just took the words right out of my mouth. I love it. So that was from Christy. She did a beautiful, yeah. fantastic. I don't even have anything else to add on that one. You guys rocked it. All right, so here's our next poll. It should be popping up on your screen. It says, do you know where to access state guidance on AT? And if not, we're going to put a link for a wakelet. This wakelet will take you to um, the AT for Kids website. And on this wakelet, um, we have one of the first Basically, um, links is to the Tennessee guidelines, the Tennessee state guidelines, and then you can find out more about that. And there are lots of other really great resources on there, um, including all of the sources that we did to uh, that we researched on, um, including some wonderful webinars. So that all is in the Wakelet as well. So that's a really great resource for you all. Ah, yeah, and the answer was mostly, it was, it was actually, I'm very proud of you all. Yes, Excellent, 43% yes, of you, beautiful. Uh, a, and I will say our, our website, it, it's kind of like a black hole sometimes, so it's hard to find everything you need, but please rely on their wakelet, and if not, you know, you can always reach out to me and help connect you with these um, resources. All right, so our next question then. There we go. Does your county have a policy or procedure for AT and AAC? I'm excited to see that, yes, a lot of counties do because I know that that is not always the case, that they have a procedure in place. All right, out of these yes and I know it's, how many of you all are the AT person for your county? That's that's a follow up question I didn't ask in a poll. And probably how many are from Rutherford County because we know that they do have that. I know of Angela and I know of Andrea Jokey and Williamson and they're both on. But that's fantastic that a lot of you, that 67% have a policy procedure. That's, that's higher than we anticipated. Um, 
we do not actually have that data. And so that's really good data for us. So thank you for that. All right, the next question. Where are you currently documenting AAC in the IEP? And this one you can mark um, wherever you are documenting it. So you don't have to pick just one. All right, looks like things are still coming in. All right. So yeah, all over the place, right? We are complete. Sorry, the poll is full and no longer accepting responses. Good to know. Um, good to know that I'm on a limit. Um, so we document all over the IEP on where AAC goes. And that's OK. Um, I know I definitely, as I got my first IEPs with assistive tech, I was like, um, I don't know exactly where I should be documenting these things. And so it's nice to know now that really anywhere in the IEP is fair game. Um, special considerations is that little tick box, super important. Um, we were talking about the fact um, when we were pre preparing for this presentation, we were talking about the fact that even the state doesn't necessarily have a good idea of how many students are actually receiving assistive technology because not everyone remembers to click the little box and that's how they pull that data. Um, so very important that we all click the little box. And then here in the state of Tennessee, it requires you then to do a services and supplementary aids if you click this, the little box, which is something they're they're working on because that's not necessarily correct, um, but they are working on that. Um, I love that a lot of you are doing things in goals and objectives. That's a super powerful area to use, um, not only for the actual goals, but even in our goals section, um, it has an area for what supports does the school personnel need in order to implement the goals and objectives and that box can be really powerful for you all that's where we can put that training piece um for staff for our parents that's where we can put that piece um i know that one kind of hit on me and i was able to figure that one out um through the research so yeah any questions about any of the documentation um, and we're going to kind of go over it in the next few slides too yeah. on different places i know to document yep. yep so feel free to jump in and chat with it but it says where and how to place aat and aac in the iep so there's not a set place that we need to put it but um, the recommendation is that you put it in one of these three places and you can put it in all three or multiple like we saw other places in addition to this. But one of them was the special um, education, which concludes the present levels and goals. And the present level section is a very good place to show kind of that evolution of the AAC process. If you want to think about it when you're doing your um, AAC evaluation even, you can show what devices you've trialed, how they're working, what things did not work, and just being able to document that allows some other speech therapist or someone else coming in behind you to see what you've been doing and why it's working. And then we want to talk about the, if you can go on to the next slide, I believe, is where um, we talked about that with the present levels and the other thing about the present levels um, we were talking about is that you're going to want to talk about it because here you can talk about what goals are achievable and measurable and stuff like that in the goals section but we also in the goals section want to consider and make sure we write um, the multiple modalities that the student may use to communicate because this is going to get back to the question that Susan said about 
what happens if that device is broken or isn't available? Um, an example is I had a student show up one day and his mom said, oh, he took the device and put it in the shower last night. So it's going to be a while before we have something to use. This was a nonverbal student, so there you're sitting thinking, oh no. <laughs> now what do we do? Because you can get something from maybe somewhere else in the district, but it's going to take you a day or two to kind of find a comparable device. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about some options, but mentioning the multiple modalities that that student can use to communicate is very important. So here's the biggie. Do I name the specific device in the IEP? What do y'all say? I should have done a poll on this one. Sorry, guys. So I've had two no's, whole bunch of no's. Whole bunch of no's. All right. So the answer is it depends. So and I had one at, person write maybe in the present levels, but not in the goals. Ah, yeah. That's very good answer. Good, good answer. So it depends on your district policy. Some districts might very, you know, flat out just be like no, which I'm not gonna fight the fight your district policy. But according to um, the research that we were doing and according to, um, you know, what we saw as best practice is we definitely want to describe the features of the AAC within within the IEP. However, if the device has particular characteristics that are you know, require the child to learn those operational skills that are unique to that device, and the kid is familiar with it and really knows it, and it would be uh, really harmful to change to a different product, name it in the present levels. Um, because, I mean, even this year, you know, newbie, got a student um, into our school district, he was a transfer, and had no idea from reading the IEP what device he was on. Um, it did not have any specific features in there that gave me a clue on what he was on. Um, ended up being proloquo, um, but there was nothing in his IEP that, you know, told me. Um, thankfully, we were able to call the, the SLP that he had been working with. Um, but, you know, if he had moved out of state, that would have been a lot more difficult to get that information. Um, and so it just really goes to show that, you know, it's important that anybody who picks up that IEP should be able to figure out what he was on. Um, so again, if it's, you know, if we're at the beginning and the kid has had it for just a little while and, you know, we're trialing, the, you know, if, if we're at the beginning stages of AAC where it's not as, you know, that kid doesn't have that motor plan down, he doesn't know that system very well, then we might just list the need, the features that are needed. Um, but if the kid knows the device, I would personally, I would suggest um, putting it into that present levels. Um, so that was definitely a new thing that I learned. Um, but it makes sense that present levels would be the place where you would put that because it's what the student is presently doing. Um, and if you write it just like that, sorry, I thought I had I had an example in there. If you write it with the statement of the student is currently using this device in parentheses, this, this, and this are why we're using that system, then you're good. Um, it does not obligate the school for that particular device. It just says this is what we're currently using and they're being successful with it. Um, but they, you know, need a robust speech generating device, blah, -de blah, -de blah, whatever the features are that the student needs. Does that all make sense? I know that's a really, that was new to me. Um, and it was, it's definitely something I had to wrap my head around. Any questions about that? Um, so far, no questions. Everyone's all right. All right. That that one took me a while to like wrap my head around because I was told very clearly that it was a no. And so and then I got that transfer student and I was like, that can't be right. 
So then we did the deep dive. So that was something very interesting to me. All right. So if you had a student, take your favorite uh, speech generating device that you have experience with and write me a general description of how you would document that in a present level then. I want at least two responses before we move on. <laughs> And let's see if everyone else can guess which device you're you're describing. Someone's typing. Give them a second. Beautiful. Love it. So we have dynamic display voice output device. So that's really good wording there. It really is. And let's see. have any more got someone else typing give them a second beautiful the other thing you can write to um, that I found when we were doing this research is talk about the grid layout so someone just mentioned that Janice mentioned that she said core vocabulary designed with grid layout described yeah. that was another thing that um, I saw a lot as you could mention the grid layout you're using. Yeah, I was thinking for LAMP, you would want to mention that motor planning um, aspect, you know, a dynamic display that capitalizes on motor planning. Um, you know, why you actually chose the device. Why is that working for that kid, right? You want to explain what's what they're using. Um, again, if your district policy says, like, please don't list the name of it, just really give a really good description so that if somebody who knows the different, you know, big players, they can figure out what they're taught, what device the kid was on. Um, we have a great response. It says, I often include the need for social language for SNAP core and the need for a strong motor plan. Um, if LAMP works for life is a better fit for the student, the need for predictive core if using touch chat with word power as the features. And then we have another one um, that came in. This is more of an example. It says John is an energetic boy that uses a six by six grid with 12 of the icons on the vocabulary mast. Um, he is able to access with direct selection with a hold time of um, 0.5 seconds. He is able to combine core words in conjunction with fringe vocabulary. And then we have a great comment here. Someone was talking about head switches. This is definitely the time to start mentioning if you're using switch eye gaze. Because or, there's more than just the AAC device. There's a lot there that they need to know what else. How do they student access this device? And for AT um, devices, you would also want to be specific in that you're describing it so someone knows what you're using. Oh man, there were some great examples in there. I love it. I love how specific some of you all were. You know, that whole time that, you know, how big their grid size is so, so, so important. Um, and as I was doing the research, I was like, man, I need to go back and adjust a couple of my IEPs that I wrote this year just because I didn't know better. Um, so, and we have a you great that. question. Yes. Um, it says, why would accounting um, would not want to mention a device? So why would they not want to mention a specific device? So a lot of times counties might be concerned that they will be on the hook for a specific device um, if that is written into the IEP. So there, there may be some counties, and I don't know this for certain, but there may be some counties where it specifically says, like, please don't list the device. Uh, or the specific device in the IEP, but and none of them are, none of them would negate being able to give a good description of what is currently being used. And I would also say too that if you list a specific device and it's the inappropriate device for that child, then you've already written into the plan that this is the one we're using. That it may not be the device that the that that child will have success with. Um, so then you would have to go back through the process and write a new IEP and and decide 
and discuss why you um, are changing that IEP based on that. Yeah. One thing that I do want to add to is if you're in the process of trialing um, a device, you do not want to document the specific name for sure because as you're trialing, you may find that that one didn't work. Even though you're thinking, I'm going to go with this product or this app, you might find in the end that it doesn't work and you change your mind. Um, we've had this happen before. And so you don't want to be with that IEP that all of a sudden you have to have another meeting. All right. So you, you all sound very knowledgeable about what all these things are, so I'll just skip that bit. All right, we have scenario four. A student needs a specialized AAC device, so an iPad with an app isn't going to work for this kid due to um, vision and motor deficits. So how and where would you describe the need for assessment into the IEP as your trialing options? So I had this happen. I got added onto their team right before their IEP year was going on and I was like, oh, we need something a little bit more specialized than what is currently being provided. Are we getting any responses? Um, so I, they're responding more to some of the other things. Um, okay. We had Angela Schaffner make a good comment. She said also methodology is why our district does not want us to um, document it. And it may or may not be the right, but that's how they address the academics. So, you know, that's the thing. There's a lot of reasons why you might want to document something and not document it. There's kind of a argument for both sides. Okay, um, we have had um, someone mentioned narratives, um, prior written notice. Um, we've also had um, the basically we're going to mention it in um, the present levels. Yeah, and that's actually what I did. I documented in the present levels and I said, you know, here's where her communication is currently, which was, you know, everything low or uh, paper based and mid tech I was throwing at her. She was picking up super quick. Um, and so I was like, you know, she needs she is demonstrating need for a more robust language system and a full AAC evaluation will be conducted um, and put it in the prior written notice that that's what we were doing. Um, and that's what what I did in that circumstance. So yeah, exactly. Beautiful. And, and her uh, device is currently in the insurance process. So hopefully that happens by the end of the year. If you have a student who is proficient on their communication device and uses it without assistance in their classroom, how would you document this in their IEP? I want these students. I don't have these students yet. OK, we're getting present levels, narratives. So we're getting some great responses. Excellent. Yeah, so if they're using it without assistance in their classroom, I was thinking of, you know, our, you know, very proficient AAC users. They are like out in the general education classrooms even. Um, and yeah, so narrative, perfect place. Um, so the one place that it would definitely need to be um, is our um, checkbox for yes, assistive technology. And, and also Susan added that <laughs> special consideration know. and she said AT check yes check yes on that one and then also um, this is where that um, supplementary aid comes into into play for sure um, and again right now the supplementary aid is required if you check the AT box 
but that may be going away as a requirement because supplementary means supplementary. Um, and so it's something from our research, it was looking like, and it might be in other states where that is not an automatic, like you have to do it if you check the box type deal. And it actually is specifically for technology and services that are only for minimal training, like the student doesn't need like trained on it per se. Um, you know, this is a lot of times where our assistive tech, like a like a, um, a text to speech um, or a speech to text might be those types of things are a lot of times. Um, our Tennessee system is not quite caught up with that yet, so don't worry about it so much. But yeah, check the box supplementary aids and narrative would be perfect. So and we, yeah. we're not going to do away with supplementary aids and services. So that right. that is a requirement for, for yes. IDEA. It's just how is that defined? And then how do we capture it on our actual platform for easy IEP? So kind of behind the scenes, we're working on that. And I know right now you guys have to enter some additional data on the supplementary aids and services page talking about the time, frequency, duration, and none of that actually prints, but it does connect to the actual device you choose. And there is a drop down which is not exhaustive. So no, you can use the custom and enter anything that you are offering that child that is assistive tech, and then it connects it um, to the IEP appropriately. But it's those um, extra duration frequency things that do not print that we're probably going to uh, look at how do we revise that piece. Uh, Megan, why do the times, why don't the times print? Uh, you know, I honestly don't have a great answer for that and I apologize. Um, I don't know if it's more of a coding issue or if it's really hard for people to kind of nail down and specify the time because it's so dependent on the assistive tech that you've selected, right? I mean, because assistive tech really could be everything from like a pencil grip to, you know, a communication device. So it's really hard, I think, for people to nail that down. So that's kind of my guess. Um, but, but I honestly don't have a, a better answer than that at the moment. Oh. Ah. All right. Do you understand how AAC funding works and who's responsible for funding a device? Always a fun one. That's the hard part, isn't it? So um, basically it comes down to it is the school's responsibility, but we can also encourage families to use their insurance because, and there are pros and cons to either for the family. Um, and so um, what are some of the pros for a family purchasing or purchasing it through their insurance? So um, it can be used both at home and at school. It can go back and forth between the two. Yeah, I think the main thing is it's the student's device. Um, there's no question about, you know, any of the does it go home over the summer does it go back and forth between school does it all those sorts of questions just kind of go away um which is nice it's also theirs and so if they move it goes with them if they graduate it goes with them um so it just really i don't know i feel like for our families who can go through insurance that's kind of the way that I, you know, really encourage my families to think about um, for their benefit, right? Like, yes, I'm a school SLP, and so I'm trying to make sure I'm being fiscally responsible for the school, but it really is just, you know, if we have determined that that is the best device for a kid, it makes sense for it to be theirs, um, in my opinion. Um, but it does, it is required for the school to be the funding source if they do not go through insurance um, in order to make sure that the student is 
you know, taken care of and ready to access their education. Um, and I know that um, on a previous presentation, Angela Schaffner had shared some great information about that, the funding, because um, she said that she was able to, in her district, get the families to go through insurance and be able to find a lot of times outside funding sources. Yeah. So then that student yeah, owns I, the device and is able to use it at home, whatever environment they need it in. So, scenario six. You're ready to write the evaluation <laughs> about funding. How does your district deal with issues regarding funding and procurement of needed AAC devices? And how have you addressed those concerns? Um, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about this. Um, but yeah, how, how have you helped dealt with that? I know, as as she said, we Rutherford County, I know, went into a really good presentation on that. But any other? Well, here's a question. So who is responsible if a student breaks a device? Because that happened to me earlier this week. That is why it's a benefit of the district to try to go through the student's insurance, because if a district purchases the device, you as a district have to pay for it because it's not covered under that three year warranty that a student's insurance and the warranty for a dedicated SGD covers. So that's why it's advantageous to try to get your families to go that route. And if not, then provide a comparable device meeting that student's needs with that appropriate language system. But I can tell you right now, my boss is asking for my totals of, and I collect how many devices I secure through insurance, how many devices we help repair through insurance, how many devices we repair through funded repairs through the student's insurance. And right now I'm at $11,000 in repairs on devices for this school year with that many students, half of our student population being out of school for half of the year. So it's very advantageous. It just is a process. And once we get it figured out, it's very easy. And I'm happy to help anybody. <laughs> yeah, it definitely, I mean, it's a huge concern um, for the school districts because yeah, kids break stuff all the time, so. All right, you have a parent asking you to send the device home. What's your response and why? Everyone's typing Saskia. So um, it says it can go home as soon as the family has been trained on how to use it. Tennessee Talks is currently planning um, parent development training and the funding focus is actually a planned webinar. And I'm also sending out our emails real quick. Excellent. So that everyone will have those if they have more questions. I will also say way, way, way back in the chat, Andrea asked a question about how does everybody document it if you're in the process of an evaluation for assistive tech? So I'd be curious to hear from some of the districts who do have AT um, leads in their county. How do you all address that? My question was actually more about oh. um, like looking at the quiet indicators consistency across the district in okay. documenting in the IEP. So I was more curious about I feel like for basically every student AT can be marked. Yes, they're using something, but does mm -hmm. the districts require 
a consultation or evaluation to mark yes, or are you marking yes gotcha. based on a team consideration? Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Sorry, I misunderstood that. I'm sure it's the way I asked it. No, it probably was. I'm trying to keep up with the thread. And um, so, Becky said she started adding yes to the narratives page the narratives during an eval. Okay. And um, I have a question up here. It says several counties have parents sign agreement for care and return of school devices. Yeah, and that's that's what I my county does. Um, so we have a just a form. Um, it also helps with our inventory, um, and it just says, you know, I will make sure to send the device to school. I am responsible for charging it overnight. I, you know, just those general, you know, here's who to contact if it is broken or needs repair. Um, it has just some general information, and then it just says, I am responsible for ensuring that it gets back to school basically. Um, but yeah, um, I had one of my administrators uh, or administrators uh, earlier this week, I was like, hey, like just making sure I have, you know, for inventory reasons, um, do I just need to send you all this form and like that covers it for the student who's gonna have it over the summer. And my, my SPED director was definitely like, uh, hold on, like we've never had a kid keep their device over the summer. And, newbie I was just like well they need it for continuing their language growth and she was just like oh yeah okay and was able to you know give the okay um she was concerned because you know devices break um but I told her you know devices break just as well at school as they do at home there's nothing we can really do about that and she agreed um but yeah so I agree that form is beautiful. Um, it can serve a couple of different purposes, which is always lovely. Um, so yeah, and I think we are running low on time. Is that correct? We are, we have about a minute left. Oh my goodness, oh my um, goodness. So well, we've kind of hit on some of the other things, um, but we do want to mention if you have questions to please, um, Feel free and contact us at Tennessee Talks. We're here to help you. I have put out the um, email addresses in the chat. This will be recorded on the Tennessee Talks website. We'll post it. And Saskia wants to let you know. Yes, we are presenting a very um, not as interactive session at AAC in the cloud. Um, we are not sure exactly which day yet. It's either June 23rd or 24th. Uh, AAC in the cloud, for anyone who doesn't know, is a two-day completely free online conference. They've been doing online conference before it was COVID, um, so they really do a great job. This is their fifth year, I believe. Um, so we will be at AAC in the cloud, and we look, we hope to see you there. Right. Thank you both so much for putting that together and sharing it with everybody. Um, one last thing too that I wanted to touch on real quickly, and it kind of um, touches one on what Andrea asked. That that special considerations page of the IEP is a requirement, right? You have to consider AT for every student. Now it's yes or no as to whether or not they require AT. And remember, AT expands far beyond um, AAC devices, which is kind of what we focused on in this particular session. But remember, AT could be um, you know, your adapted utensils, different seating, tool, um, positioning equipment, all sorts of things. So is that piece of device or equipment necessary for that child to access and participate in his education? Um, is it something that he needs to be able to participate in any of the state mandated testing? So those are the kind of discussions that that, that section of the IEP should really be generating so that the whole team can think about what are these child's needs? Uh, what are his needs across the day in the different areas? How may he be limited in his participation in any of these areas um, that we need to provide some assistive tech? So just wanted to kind of highlight that because I think there's always a lot of confusion about those two definitions. Um, but thank you ladies so much for putting this together and sharing this. And um, as they both kind of um, alluded to, we are working again kind of behind the scenes to provide you some more um, information because we know this topic is one 
uh, with a lot of questions, we're working on some guidance documents for you, um, but always feel free to reach out with any questions you have and also reach out to any of the Tennessee Talks folks because they are a wealth of information that can help you in your district. All right, any last words or any last questions? All right. Okay. Well, everybody have a wonderful evening. Thanks again. And again, if anybody needs a certificate of participation, just send me an email. And thank you for everyone for participating.